And it's a great pleasure to be here. This is my first time in India. Um, I look tired. It's just because I got up like, two days straight and flying. We literally left in local time in Colorado at 5 in the afternoon, and we got here last night at about 7 p.m., so all that time in the airports. Um, but um, yeah, thank you all for coming. So today we'll talk a little bit about microbubbles. Um, I'll start with an introduction, and then I'll get into synthesis um, after the break. Okay? So the, the introduction is going to be a bit of an overview, but also we're going to dig into a, a little bit into the science of bubbles. Um, just that I think it's worth going a little bit into my background just so you know where I'm coming from. Both of my bachelor and my PhD degrees were in chemical engineering, so I'm a chemical engineer by training. Um, and that's the perspective that I took initially, in particular, to looking at microbubbles. So it's a chemi kind of viewpoint. Um, and at the time, I was surrounded by, well, the others in the field were mainly electrical engineers or radiologists, cardiologists in the, in the med medical field. Some physicists, but not too many chemists and not a lot of chemical engineers. So, and I still feel like that is still almost the case today. There's not a lot of chemical engineers in the field, um, but those that do come into the field have a big impact. Um, so for example, at the core lecture, at, right after this workshop or this, this course, there's a the main bubble conference in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And the main lecture, the core lecture, is from a chemical engineer from Caltech. Um, so there are chemical engineers having an impact on the field. And uh, so I, I, I recommend that you consider this field if you're interested. Um, so my PhD in particular was actually on microbubbles. And I'll show you a, a, a study that sparked my interest initially. Um, that into microbubbles and how to look at them from that engineering perspective. Um, once I finished in the, doing some chemical engineers from the chemistry perspective, I wanted to figure out more about how to utilize them. And that is the biomedical applications of microbubbles. So I joined uh, Kathy Ferrara's lab at UC Davis in biomedical engineering. Um, and she is one of the world's experts in applications of microbubbles. She just recently got inducted in the National Academy of Engineering, and she is really known as a pioneer for, uh, for applying bubbles for imaging and for therapeutic applications. Um, I also had an opportunity to do a postdoc in radiology at the University of Arizona, so I got to be closer to the clinic um, and see what, how ultrasound is used and how contrast agents are used. Uh, in particular for cancer patients. And then uh, I got tired of being so close to MDs and I wanted to get back to chemical engineering, so I took a position uh, at Columbia University. Um, after our third child was born in New York City, we decided to get back out west where I'm from. And so I took a position in, at, uh, at CU Boulder in mechanical engineering. So it's a bit of a uh, a stretch for me to go from chemical to mechanical engineering, but there is a, a, quite a bit of overlap in terms of thermodynamics, but specifically mechanics. And uh, the bubbles interact with mechanical waves, and that's what makes them so useful. So I think it's good, as if, if you're coming here from a chemical engineering background, to start to absorb some of the some of the physics and, in particular, mechanics, because that becomes really critically important uh, for understanding microbubbles. And the other engineering discipline that's key, actually, to all this is electrical engineering. I got a great opportunity to work with Piero Corfoli at the University of Florence last year on a sabbatical. And he is an electrical engineer, and they're Latin, he's actually one of the, uh, the pioneers of the field of Doppler ultrasound imaging. That is imaging blood flow and the velocity of blood flow. <clears throat> and uh, his lab, about five years ago or so, they, they made the ambitious plan to create an open platform ultrasound system. So right now, if you buy an ultrasound system for imaging, it's sort of a black box. You can't engineer your own pulse sequences, and then you don't get the raw data. You get the image, and the image is processed. Um, and it's often done non-linear. So it doesn't always correspond in a linear way, for example, the image intensity, pixel brightness, to the number of bubbles. Um, if you want to do that, you need to get in, you need to tinker with innards, 
of the ultrasound system, we just created a system that's much cheaper for about uh, 40, 50K in US dollars, which is really inexpensive for an industry system for that developer. So I got the opportunity to work in his, in his lab for a year, and now we have one of the systems, it's called the Hula Hall, in our lab, which we're starting to get into. But for those of you who get into more of the electrical engineering side of things, I would highly recommend you look at, at these guys. Okay, so where am I from? So I'm, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. So Colorado is, is right here. It's right on the interface between the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains. It's right at that interface. We call it the front range of the United States. And uh, Boulder is, is one of the top engineering schools in that region, in that mountain West region. But what's beautiful, what's nice about Boulder is it sits right next to the Flatiron Mountains. Um, this is the, this beautiful uh, rock formations, and then on the other side of this are the Great Rocky Mountains and the Continental Divide and so on. And so it's actually possible for me to drop my kids off at school, drive up in about five ski runs, drive back down and be back in the office by 10 30. So that's a really nice benefit to being part of CU Boulder. But CU Boulder is also known for its academics. We have nine Nobel Prize winners here um, at, uh, at CU Boulder. And the engineering uh, department in particular, the engineering school is outstanding. So it's kind of a bold, nice combination of a uh, great place to live and a nice university. So that's my spiel for the university. <laughs> um, but I'm here to talk about bubbles, so I hope to inspire you with this great quote from Lord Kelvin, and you'll recognize this name as the temperature scale that you use. Kelvin, right, the absolute temperature scale. He says, a little sofa, an observer, you may study it all your life and draw one lesson after another in physics from it. And I think it's absolutely true. There's, since I started my PhD way back in 1999, I found that there's just more and more beautiful physics that unfold the more you study. So it's a beautiful field, and there's so much to learn about chemistry, physics, and great applications. I say micro bubbles too, not just the soap bubble, but in particular micro bubbles. Okay, so <clears throat> you guys are going to get a lot, an in-depth study of micro bubbles in this course. And in fact, when I was assembling these slides, I realized these are slides that have been assembled for almost 20 years. And I've never assembled them in this way into an entire course. So this is the most comprehensive course that I'm aware of on the field of microbubbles, and in particular taking a chemical engineering perspective. So um, it, was a, it was great fun putting all these slides together, going back through slides that were ancient, <laughs> slides I put together from my preliminary exam in 1999 until, until now. Um, so, introduction to microbubbles will be today, and also in the second half is synthesis of microbubbles. Critical, critical piece. Also, size sorting methods. It turns out when you synthesize bubbles, you get a polydisperser, broad size distribution, so there's good ways to, to select sizes that you want. Also, there's new ways to make bubbles. This is kind of along the lines of synthesis, but using microfluidic methods. A uh, great deal of work has been just recently in the last few years in particular in this field. Um, we have to talk about bubble stability because it turns out that micron sized bubbles are not so easy to keep stable. You have to use special ways of making them and of stabilizing them. So we'll talk about their stability. Also, gas exchange. There's a lot of good thermodynamics and kinetics, diffusion, mass transport in here. But gas exchange is critically important because. You may have a stable bubble in the vial, so once you inject it into the body, it's going to experience what we call gas exchange, where it's exchanging its interior gas with the metabolic gases. And that's going to create a dynamic effect on the bubble. So it's good to understand what, what's going to happen in the bubble once you inject it into the bloodstream. And then we'll get into actual engineering bubbles. What can we do to engineer bubbles for imaging and for drug delivery? And we, we keep them separate because there's really two completely different applications here. And we can actually combine them in theranostics. Theranostics means therapy and diagnostics. So you can have image-guided drug delivery. But the field has been hampered to some degree by the reliance on bubbles that were initially developed for imaging that have been used for drug delivery. Under the, under the context of, well, it's easier 
because they're already FDA approved for imaging, so let's just use them for, for, for therapy. Because these bubbles are not at all optimized for therapy. And so there's only so far you can deal with these bubbles. But there's a lot more that can be done in terms of engineering them for imaging, in particular molecular imaging. That is imaging the physiological state of tissue. So uh, there's a lot of great work that's being done in, in these two areas. In the area of contrast against ultrasound and what we call targeted drug delivery. We'll get into biocompatibility. This is, of course, critically important if you're going to inject something in the bloodstream to understand the fate in, bio, in the biological system of your body. What are things that can lead to a triggering, for example, the immune response? How can we avoid an immune response? And we'll end with nanodrops. It's kind of funny because nanodrops are, in a way, a precursor to microbubbles. What's, what separates them is not just the nano versus the micro, but the drops versus the bubbles. Bubbles are gas-filled particle. Drops are emulsion. They're liquid-filled particle. You can make drops to turn into bubbles, and you can make bubbles turn into drops. And so this is really the area that's interesting. It's called acoustic droplet vaporization. Um, that's interesting for the bio focus on. So ways to make nanoparticles that turn into bubbles in situ when you trigger them with ultrasound. So I'll talk a bit about that too um, in the last lecture. Okay, so let's just start with the basics. What are microbubbles? So if I was to give you a vial of microbubbles, it would look like this. This is about a two or three milliliter vial of bubbles. Only about a milliliter, a milliliter of half volume of bubbles. This is just gas headspace. Um, but this is this, these are the microbubbles. It's a milky white suspension to the eye. Okay? Um, so you can think of it actually as a suspension or a foam. If you let it sit long enough, all the bubbles will rise up. So it does, it does form a foam. But what's interesting about bubbles is that, about microbubbles, is, is that even when they rise up into a foam, that is a high volume percentage of gas, they remain as discrete spherical particles. Okay? So this is why we call it a spherical foam. That's, it's different than a polygonal foam. A polygonal foam is what we're used to with soap suds, maybe when you're washing dishes or something, you're used to these, or beer suds, you, you see these bubbles that form and they have these angles. Um, the, the micron size bubbles, these micro bubbles, are different. They, they actually remain as discrete particles, which is nice because it means that you can collect them in your foam and resuspend them. So this is critically important for, uh, for like centrifugation and things like that. So when the bubbles are initially made, their concentration is about 10 to the 9th of a trillion microbubbles number per milliliter or per cubic centimeter. Okay? So that's the initial concentration that you typically make. Um, and you get these discrete spherical particles less than 10 microns in diameter. When, when they're injected for ultrasound imaging, they're diluted to about a million microbubbles per milliliter. So about one to a thousand dilution in the body. That is a milliliter, is about a milliliter of this stuff is injected into a, in a typical adult. And we have about four liters of blood, a typical adult. So it's about a one to a thousand dilution. You get on the order of a million bubbles per but like I said, you can centrifuge, or you can just wait over time, the bubbles will collect at the top. And they can concentrate, and they can get up to on the order of a trillion microbubbles. So million, billion, trillion microbubbles. When they get in this state, they turn more like a sort of a viscoelastic foam. Because much of the properties is dictated by the fluid flow that's in between all these sort of no slip boundary conditions of the bubble surface. So it's it's kind of ironic that you add more and more gas and it becomes more viscous. But that's the nature of, uh, of flow systems. Okay, so a micro bubble, we'll define it as between 0.1 and 10 microns. And that could be diameter or it can be radius, right? Radius is really the fundamental dimension of a bubble because it's typically spherical and so the, the, what's the dia what's the main 
dimension of a, of a sphere, it's radius, right? You can get its surface area and its volume based on the radius. Um, but often people are interested in diameter for some reason. Maybe it's because we think about capillaries, the size of capillaries, that is the smallest vessels that are in your body are called capillaries and they have, they have sizes on the order of five to 10 microns in diameter. Okay? So I think that because of the biocompatibility issue, there's been a lot of interest in calling it diameter. Notice that sometimes I use a one and sometimes I use a point one. The reason, the reason I'm using a point one here is because nano drops are becoming more and more prevalent and so are so-called nano bubbles. Um, We'll talk about why nano isn't great for ultrasound imaging, per se, because you don't get a high scattering cross-section. That is, you don't get a lot of backscattered echo from a nano-sized bubble. That's why micro has been more important than nano over the course of the years. But there's more and more interest in nano because, um, number one, we can make droplets that are nano-sized that turn into micro-bubbles. And number two, there's more uh, development of high-frequency ultra-linear arrays, that is, ultrasound probes that can be used to an image with high resolution, using high frequencies. And the smaller bubbles give you higher resonant frequencies. We'll talk all about this in more detail. But what that means is that nano starts to become more interesting. Okay? So it's sub-micron. Now, the nanoparticle people will always say that this none of this is nano because nano goes from like Depends on which, which scientists you talk to, they might say zero to 10 nanometers, or they might say maybe up to 100 nanometers. But rarely do you get one that will call a nanometer uh, up to a micron a nanoparticle. So it's kind of funny how all these uh, different um, words come into context. But, uh, but in the field, you'll see. You'll see it repeated throughout time. There will be over and over again the first person who will claim that they've made nanobubbles and that they need something completely different than microbubbles, but I would classify them sort of all together because it's, it's their small size and their high ultrasound scattering uh, cross-section that really defines them and makes them useful. It turns out that a bubble of this size in a fluid is completely unstable. And it's not that it's not mechanically stable. Mechanically, it's stable. It's thermodynamically unstable, and therefore it will dissolve. The reason it's unstable is because there's a high curvature associated with this. Imagine a capillary of only one micron in diameter. Fluid would feel pretty high in that capillary. Right? If you've ever taken a capillary and pulled up a fluid in a glass capillary, imagine if its diameter was only one micron. You get a really high height of fluid in there. That's because there's a large pressure. Um, the gas core pressure, because of surface tension and curvature, because of the curvature, the surface tension leads to a net force that points towards the center of the bubble. That force has to be balanced by the gas core pressure. So what that means is when it finally balances, the gas core pressure is higher than it is in surrounding the fluid. In fact, it can be in, in atmosphere higher inside the bubble than it is outside the bubble. One atmosphere, imagine that. So you have one atmosphere out here in the medium, and inside the bubble, two atmospheres. We'll talk about bubble stability and, and we derive an equation called the Epstein plus equation. It, it defines bubble stability. But basically it says, how long can a bubble survive that has all this low cost pressure? In order to stabilize it, we have to basically eliminate the surface tension. Okay, it's not the curvature that's necessarily the problem, it's the surface tension. But if we can put a lipid layer there, and I'll define what lipids are in more detail. If we can put a lipid layer down, a lipid monolayer for example, we can reduce that surface tension, basically eliminate that surface tension. Why do we use lipid? Well, why does our body use lipid to do the exact same thing? Our body uses lipid to coat the lung of the okay? And these are the tiny sacs, of the smallest compartment of gas in the lung. They kind of look like grapes. They're, they're these tiny sacs, and they're almost like bubbles. In fact, there are some physiologists who have argued that the lung alveoli are bubbles. Um, Scarpelli, for example, in this argument. 
And it seems that it still hasn't been completely resolved yet because they can't image inside the lung very well without destroying um, artifacts. So they're made in factory buildings inside the lung. But, yes, question. So we need to stabilize the gas flow, that's right. So we are using liquid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to, to stabilize the gas flow, we need to reduce the surface area, right? Right. So what if we use uh, some chemical surface area instead of using liquid? It could be more cheaper than anything. So is it possible to do this? Yes, you can use uh, liquid as well. Um, and the reason why is that uh, you can use uh, liquid can, in principle, be used to stabilize the building. It has to have two properties. Number one, it has to be able to get to that interface. So it has to be, um, well, you have to find a way to get into that interface. Either it can absorb, or you can do some processing, like double emulsions or something like that, to get into the interface. But, and number two, it needs to, to basically eliminate surface tension. Um, so, are there surfactants? There are some surfactants that have been developed. Like there's a, a group um, in the uh, Drexel University in Pennsylvania, uh, Maggie Wheaton, who has made uh, span and tween surfactants or both industrial type surfactants and stabilized bubbles. The problem is that they're not very viable. They, they, for some reason, the surfactant is, doesn't mix well. Whereas this lipid literally is the molecules that comprise our body, so our body has. It just becomes our body and becomes metabolized by the normal processes of the body. So that's the critical issue is, you'll see there's two themes in why we think lipid. Number one, biocompatibility. Number two, well, it, first of all, it's functional, right? It does its function, but, but number two, um, it's very compliant, as we'll see. So it, it's a, it's a monolayer that, that allows the bubble to do its thing under ultrasound, expand and contract, um, and then at the end of it, stabilizes the bubble again. And so, uh, as I'll show you, there's other types of shells that have been developed that haven't uh, succeeded in this. In this and I was, as I was trying to point out, this is a the use of lipid is actually biomimetic because this is what our lungs use. Um, these are these are natural um, lipids that are formed in the body, and in fact, the main comp composition of, of Definity, which is the first lipid commercialized bubble, is DPPC, diphosphatidylcholesterol. That lipid is the same lipid that's the main lipid component of lung surfactant. And it stabilizes that gas liquid interface, provides a compliant interface, lowers the surface tension, and it does exactly what we want it to do. So, uh, we, often we use uh, longer chains than C C16. I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit to get even more stable levels. Um, but it's basically biomimetic. As you, if you've been following the, the stealth liposome uh, literature and, and how it's progressed with time, you realize that polyethylene glycol is often used to stabilize particles and liposomes and make them non immunogenic um, to reduce their immunogenicity and, the, and so forth. And the idea that that was originally done back, back when they were developing liposomes back in the 80s and 90s was to they were looking at the red blood cell and how long it would circulate. The red blood cell would circulate for like 60 days in the body. Okay? But the particles they were injecting were getting cleared within an hour or two. And so they were trying to mimic the surface of the red blood cell. And the red blood cell is this glyco, it is not pig, because pig is a synthetic polymer, but it has um, sugary residues called glycocalyx that forms what's called glycocalyx. And they were trying to reproduce the blood glucose. This steric polymer layer that inhibits, um, that provides a repulsive force between two particles that are coming together, cells, or whatever. And the adoption of those, of those same lipids that were developed for liposomes to kill, kill bubbles has been very effective because these polymers come together, they're actually attached to the lipid, so the lipid is an anchor 
and then you have the polymer, and the polymers come together and form a brush. And when those two brushes come together, um, they compress and they provide a repulsive force that prevents coalescence of the bubbles. So we'll talk about coalescence too, specifically in the in, in some, in some recent work that's beautiful in the area of uh, a bubble coalescence on microfluidic devices. Let me jump into a little bit more here about composition. So the main lipid components um, are typically phosphatidylcholines. And so we have a, a choline group here, which is positively charged. It's a nitrogen with two methyls hanging off of it. And then it's attached to this methyl group here. And it's positively charged. And then it's attached to a phosphate group, which is negatively charged. And so overall, the molecule is a, lip, is a neutral molecule, but it's got charge separating, so we call it Twitter ionic. And then it's, this phosphate group is attached to a glycerol backbone. Let's see the glycerol here. And this glycerol then is attached to two fatty acid chains. So this is the basic structure of a lipid. Um, one time a computer scientist asked me to define a lipid. I said, well, it's kind of got like a fat group on it and a salt group on it. So he said, okay, so it's bacon. So I don't know if there's some bacon in the video. In America, we always have bacon for breakfast. And it's like a salty, fatty, kind of sweet looking piece of pork. Um, now, the thing is, these can be synthesized at really high grade. Okay? So you can purchase these from companies that will synthesize these for you. Like in the United States, Avanti with polar lipids. Um, there's NOF in Japan. I'm sure there must be a company in India. Does anybody know a company in India that makes synthetic lipids? Or... Okay. Um, there's certainly companies in Europe that do it. So the nice thing about it is you can you can order these lipids with different head groups. Some of them don't have a glycerol chain, but have a different kind of chain. And then you can also order with these tails being different, kind of different chemistry. For example, they could have a double bond, or they could have two double bonds, more, one more double bonds, or you can just increase the length. Now, we don't want to use double bonds because the double bonds introduce a kink in the chain that prevents the two lipids from coming into close contact. We need those bubbles to pack, we need those lipids to pack tightly on the bubble surface in order to reduce that surface tension. The problem with a, a double bond, if you have a double bond here, it provides a kink and those lipids can't pack, and so rather than uh, pack together, they just they just collapse into the subphase, and they'll never stabilize the normal. Okay, so we need nice saturated diesel chains, and um, you can you can bury them. You can actually purchase these between C12, that's 12 carbons long, or 24 carbons long. And it's surprising, it seems like well, that's only 10 carbons, but that gives you a lot of room to work with, okay? Think about the analogy of, uh, of these to just hydrocarbons, okay? Think about going from like propane, which is a gas, butane, which is a liquid at room temperature, but it's pretty close to being a gas, has a high vapor pressure, you can use it in butane lighters, okay? Uh, to pentane, hexane, decane, now you start getting into liquids, and you keep going up and you can get into solids, right? Um, so you can get different states in the shell of a lipid by using different, different chain rates. This gives you a large variety of different uh, phase states that you can get. So C12 is more like a gas or a liquid, C24 forms a solid. So I also mentioned that we use pegylated lipids. Um, here's a really inexpensive pegylated lipid that you can do it. It's not a, it's not a, a phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylethanolamine, but it, does, it just has a, a, uh, a fatty acid chain here. Okay, but it's really inexpensive. So this is a steatine or stearate, like a stearic acid, that's attached to polyethylene glycol. So you might know polyethylene glycol, polyethylene oxide, same, same molecule, it's made in different ways, but the same basic molecule. 
And um, so it's CH2, CH2, oxygen, and heat. Okay, so about 40 units of that, or molecular weight of about 2,000 Dalton. Um, and that gives you, this is your hydrofluid part, this is your hydrofluid part. So this will form a brush. Um, it also is a peg lipid. These are cheap. So you can, in the United States, you can get a box, I think it's 250 grams, or not a box, but a big bottle of this, 250 grams, it comes as a solid, it's like a waxy solid. Um, and it's only about 20 to 30 dollars by US dollars. So this is really inexpensive. Um, this is a lot more expensive, but it works better. This is a uh, diesterol phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Okay, so it's it's kind of like these lipids, but um, instead of having a choline group, it has an emphasis of meat group. So it's kind of an ethanol meat group. And then it's attached to peg. So this has 40 units of peg, this has 45 units of peg. This would be peg 2000. You can also get these lipids as peg 1000 or peg 5000. The uh, I typically use 2000. But um, Definity, which is a commercially available agent, has uses PIG 5000. What's the trade-off? Well, the larger the, the PIG, this, the larger the PIG chain, the, lar the, the larger the distance, right? The, 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 the thicker the brush layer, therefore, the longer range the repulsion will be between the two bubbles. So it seems like you should always just use longer and longer chains, so it gives you better and better stability. But as you increase the hydrophilic to hydrophobic balance, it becomes more soluble. The CMC drops, the, the critical micelle concentration drops. And I'll, I'll show you, uh, actually, the lipid resonance time, I'll show you the thermodynamic of this, but the lipid re resonance time is, is inversely proportional to the CMC. So a lower CMC is better. You don't want a higher CMC. You don't want a large hydrophilic. What, what that all means is, if it's more hydrophilic, it pops out more easily into the subface. It doesn't, it's not pinned to the bubble surface, which is what we need. You need it to be thermodynamically pinned to the bubble surface. Okay, so, and then what, why is this, why is this better than this? Well, it's got two hydrophobic chains, so that lowers the CMC by several orders of magnitude. Um, and it also packs better together with these other, also two chain. So it packs better, and um, and it's it's going to stay in one layer. And how do we get them to the surface? Well, typically what you do first is you make liposomes. So liposomes are a precursor to bubbles. You first make liposomes. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen liposomes, don't know what a liposome is. Liposome actually in Greek means a lipid bubble, but it's not a bubble. This is what confuses people about it a little bit. Um, in fact, affinity was originally called an epigenic liposome. It's not. Um, a liposome has a water interior and a water exterior. Okay? So aqueous on the inside, aqueous on the, on the inside, aqueous on the outside. And instead of a monomolecular layer, it's a bilayer. Okay? It's a very different structure than a, a bubble. Hugely different to have a liquid inside and a gas. It makes all the world a difference in terms of the application we're talking about. So first you make these liposomes, which are easy to make and they're stable, and then you need to absorb them onto small gas particles. So you need some way to entrain the gas into the liquid. Now when you do that, you create a lot of surface area, so it takes work to do that. But when, when you do that, um, the thermodynamics will drive lipids to absorb onto the nucleus and form this monomolecular layer. Okay, so if you think again of the bacon analogy, you have fat and you have salt. The salt will face the water, and the fat part will face the gas core, and that asymmetry leads to an orientation of the molecule at the interface, and then therefore you can pack them together, and they really form this nice structured. And again, they stabilize the gas core. They diminish surface tension. They also provide some impedance to gas transfer. 
Okay, but I'm going to argue that there's been s some theories that the, the lipid can stabilize the bubble by becoming in, uh, impermeable. That's not true. The lipid will be impermeable. Okay. Uh, so it does impede gas transfer, but it doesn't completely stop it. It provides mechanical stability. I'll show you some data to back that up. And it inhibits coalescence. So these are the ways to stabilize the gas bubble. I, I still, there's still a question whether bubbles are thermodynamically stable, these micro bubbles, even after they form their full monorail. I would say they're not thermodynamically stable, but they're kinetically trapped, and they're sitting in a pretty shallow energy bubble. So, uh, so they, they, there could be, they, they eventually do dissolve, given time goes to infinity, they'll probably dissolve, but they can be stable on the shelf or days to weeks to months. I've even had bubbles that were several years old that we pulled out. You know, whenever somebody finishes their dissertation, they're always going to my lab, they're always going back and finding those first vials of bubbles that they made. And it was their first vial of bubbles, so they were really precious. This is the first time they made bubbles. And they put them in their fridge, and then they, they finish their PhD and they're cleaning up. And I was making clean up old stuff. And they find those old bubbles in there, and there's still some bubbles in there. There's still some micro bubbles. Um, so you might look at this and say it's a simple, okay, it's just a bubble. What's the big deal, right? Um, as my dad once told me, it's just soda pop, it's fizz. What's the big deal? Well, I look at it from the standpoint of a chemical engineer. So when I see the bubble, I see a lot of things that we can change about the bubble and a lot of properties that would be impacted by the bubble change in terms of the parameters. Uh, so number one composition. What kind of lipid and what type of gas are you using to form these bubbles? Okay, but the composition, for example, in the emulfaction of the phospholipid, the emulfaction of the emulsifier, the emulsifier is that phagolated lipid. Or you have, also have charged lipids, so what mole fraction of charged lipids do you use? And that will impact many different properties. This ultimate surface tension. The viscoelasticity of the lipid shell. The gas permeability of the shell. Also the solubility of the shell. And the mechanics of the shell. How does it fold? Does it shed lipid? Or does it does lipid remain associated with lipids? Um, does it buckle? When you have the emulsifier is pegulated, it forms a brush. What's the density of the brush? What's the charge density or zeta potential? These are all properties that can be affected by composition. On the surface of the bubble, we have you know, surface charge, we have the brush. There's a lot of good physics in here about the architecture of the brush. For example, a bimolar brush where we have two different chain lengths, it's a great physics problem, but it's also very useful in biomedical imaging, as I'll show you. Microstructure, it turns out that the lipids don't form this nice uniform layer like I showed you in my last picture, but they form phases, they form structures on the surface, and those structures have shapes and properties um, that will ultimately affect all of these parameters. And then even once you once you define all of these, then you, you can still add things onto the top of the bubble. Often the pigs, pig chains can have a functional group, it can be charged, or it can have a ligand on it that binds to another particle, like a nanoparticle. It can be charged, you can put down layers of uh, polyions, and you can put, use like things like layer by layer assembly. So there's a lot of different things that the engineer can do. Uh, the engineer tends to suffer from, uh, what do they call it, uh, something creep when you the design of a, of a, of a, a remote control and you put way too many buttons on that cycle. Something creep, right? Somebody must have heard of you. You're engineers, right? What's the, what's the term I'm looking for here? Um, you know, you know what this is? You mean, so the, the often used example is when you have a, uh, a remote control, and if you look at the remote controls from the 90s in particular, they were enormous things. And they had all these 
buttons on them. But nobody can figure out how to use the darn thing. It's like too many bunch of, it's like too much, too much function on it, right? Well, this is the problem also with microbubbles. Like you can do all this stuff with bubbles, but then you have to get it, before you go to humans, there's this big wall called the FDA. Um, and so maybe you have something in Namibia that's, that's like this, right? Because it's basically saying, okay, that's fine. It sounds like a great application, but what's it made of exactly? What's the structure of exactly? And how can you convince us that you're going to make that exact same composition and exact same structure on every single particle that you make, in every single batch that you make? And then that, that's when all these extra whistles and buttons um, start to cause problems, right? Um, so it's a, it's a balance between simplicity and function. So it's, it's an elegance. You want an elegant bubble design that will fit your application. Um, when I first started looking at these bubbles, I was introduced to this mechanical or material science engineering paradigm, which I thought was a, a critical, a critically important viewpoint to look at when you're taking, when you're talking about any colloidal system, micro bubbles, emulsions, any colloidal system. Um, it was actually first uh, written about by Dennis Kim and, and David Needle, but in particular Dennis Kim in his dissertation at Duke University. In 1999, and I think it's it's so critically valuable to look at it from this perspective. So, first, you think about a material from the standpoint of what is its molecular composition and how is it made. How is it made in the current state? Those two things will define a structure, and that is a microstructure or maybe even a nanostructure, the structure of how the, of the organization of those molecules. That structure will determine the properties of that material. Okay? And ultimately, the properties determine the performance. Okay? So you want to have this kind of forward-looking view of how you can engineer it to get the performance that you want. So often, you're starting here, and you're setting your design parameters, and then you're going back through this, and you're iterating through this, um, through this paradigm. Right? So with bubbles, I've drawn this kind of nice cartoon. You have different things with composition, lipids and gases that you can use. Different ways to process sonication, size selection, that create different structures, like phase separation or different brush geometries. Don't worry about writing all this down. I'm going to go into much more detail about each of these things. But once you define that structure, now you've also given these properties. You need ways to measure those properties and define those properties. And those ultimately will determine the performance. One, one performance goal for here is persistence time. So long circulating bubbles, for example. But there's other performance criteria you might want. You might want short circulating bubbles. If you want to deliver a gas in the bloodstream, if you're using the bubbles to do that, um, then you might want them to have a short persistence in the bloodstream. Just deliver the gas, dissolve away. Right? So all these things are So this is a study, it was actually published back in 2003, but it was based on a dissertation by Dennis and John Kim at Duke University that was finished in 1999. And it got published in Langmuir in 2003, and I asked him, why did it take so long? Dennis, why did it take so long to publish this work? And he said it had been in science for a while, it had been going through all these reviews, 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 and finally, he left the lab, and I guess David Needham got tired of it this morning. But uh, um, and I, I can see why he was, he was having a hard time in science, because it's a beautiful paper. But there's so much detail here. And then, you know, if you read science papers, they need to be short and sweet and get a point across um, in a precise way. But um, there's too much detail here for that. But I found it beautiful. Much more interesting than a typical science paper if you're doing engineering with microbubbles. Um, so mainly, they work by Dennis Kim. I think these, these were uh, two students who came in and helped finish it up. And then David Needham is a, is a professor who oversaw this work at, again, at Duke University. David Needham is really known not so much for microbubbles, but for 
um, temperature sensitive liposomes. So raise your hand if you've heard of temperature sensitive liposomes. Couple, okay, good. So temperature sensitive liposomes are liposomes, this water filled, bilayer film uh, encapsulated particle that can contain a drug like DNA or some other kind of drug in the nucleus compartment. And they're, they're engineered so that when you heat them up, they, they release their, their contents. And there's different ways that you can heat up the body. Focus ultrasound is one, but there's other ways. Um, you can use microwaves, you can use different ways to heat up the body. And so, uh, so he's really known for that, and that's where this focus much of his research. In this paper, they looked at the effect of, of composition and microstructure on the mechanical properties of bubbles. And they're looking at a particular mechanical property called the shear viscosity or the shear yield. I'll show you those in a second here. But these are, uh, these are phosphatylcholines, phosphatylcholines or phosphatylcholines, that have two chains, di, one, two, three, three dies, or two chains. And there's the lipid nomenclature, steroid oil means C18, 18 carbons with zero double bonds. So the, the colon and the zero means zero double bonds, and all of these are zero double bonds, okay? So just get used to that. If you're making bubbles, you don't want to use, like, SOPC, for example, which has a double bond, you need to lay it for it. You, you typically use two steric, or two, uh, not necessarily steric, but two uh, uh, fully hydrogenated Saturated and they go from C, they try they tested C eighteen, C twenty, C twenty two, C twenty four. So even numbers. Why the even numbers? Because those are cheaper actually. <laughs> if you go and try, if you try to buy the ones that are odd numbers, they're more expensive. For some reason. They're just not as common. Um, and here are these here are the acronyms. So yes, yay, B, and B, 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 C. Number of carbons per chain. And, but here's the key parameter over here. This is the main phase transition temperature. I'll define that in more detail, but just think of it as a melting temperature. The melting temperature increases almost linearly with uh, any such thing. So we're getting more and more solid material. So they're testing these. They have the main lipid component. They also threw in pig's 40 steroid. This is this pigulated emulsifier molecule. That's really cheap, okay? Fake 40 steroid, and then they used um, also fluorescent dye. So they did some fluorescent solution. They did an ingenious technique, okay? I think this is a beautiful technique. I talked to Dennis Kim about it. He hated this technique because it's so hard to do, actually. And when you have to collect the data, it takes a long time. Okay? So I can sympathize. Anybody who's done experiments on individual bubbles will sympathize with what this means when you get these data points. It's often taken for granted by those who read the paper and just see, oh, there was 20 or 30 data points. Why didn't they go for 100 or 2,000? Well, these are hard experiments to do. Let me show you why. He has these, um, this, this chamber that fits on a microscope, and there's like two chambers, okay? And there's three different micropipettes. And he has this thing on a, on, a chain, on a stage, so on a microscope stage, so he can move them back and forth, so he can move the bubble or, or these, these um, micropipettes to different chambers. And basically what he does is he takes a bubble, okay, and he, he grabs it with one pipette, okay? And then he puts, takes the other, so he holds it with a measuring pipette, and then he takes this transfer pipette and he uses it as sheath around the bubble. And he takes it from an environment that's saturated with gas to an environment that's undersaturated with gas. Okay? When you paint it in, when you put it in a desaturated environment, the degassed environment, the bubble starts to shrink. He uses that to pull a projection into the pipette. Then he takes the, the measured pipette, or the sorry, the transfer pipette, puts it back over the bubble. It moves the bubble back in saturated water so that it doesn't shrink anymore, and then he runs an experiment. Okay. So, just remember it's a 10 micron size bubble or so. So, this is like one tenth the size of a human hair, and you've got three of these things, and they're 
all have to be aligned. So it's, it's quite a task. But this is what his, his images look like. So initially he had a bubble. Initially he had a bubble, okay? And he grabbed onto it with the holding pipe there. Then he did all this, all this um, use of a carrier or a transport pipe that moved it to a different chamber, causing it to be in a degassed environment. And like a balloon, this bubble deflated. And he had a suction pressure on this pipette, so it pulled that extra skin of the balloon or bubble into the pipette. Then he brought it back to the gas saturated environment. And he came at it with another pipette called the measuring pipette. He attached it exactly on the opposite side. And then he applied a suction pressure. And as he inside apply the suction pressure, he created a projection that went into that pipette. And as this projection went into the pipette, this projection shrank. So it was actually the, the shear of lipid around the bubble into the other pipette. So by carefully measuring the suction pipette pressure or the, in, the, in the measuring pipette, and then the projection length, he was able to determine the shear viscosity of the lipid layer. This is what his data looked like. Uh, L over RP, this is the length of the projection over the initial size, or this is R, this is the radius of the pipette, and this is the pressure. So you can apply different pressures, and then he, for example, he jumps up in pressure, so he pulls out suction, and the lipid is slowly, is slowly um, shearing. And so he's measuring the, the increase in the length of the projection over time with this line. Nice linear relationship, right? And he uses that slope of that line to determine the viscosity. But what he notices is that you have to apply a certain amount of, of stress to even get this layer to move at all. If you didn't apply enough suction pressure, it would just sit there, nothing would move. So he, there was a yield, there was a yield stress. And that, so we call it the shear unit that had to be measured. And then, um, based on the slope, you could get the shear viscosity, the surface shear viscosity, using uh, this slope here. So we plotted the surface shear viscosity as a function of what we call the reduced temperature. Now, this is, the reduced temperature is the same as increasing the diesel chain length of the lipid. It's actually the temperature that's normalized by the melting temperature of the lipid. Okay, so there's, remember that the melting temperature increases almost linearly with the caseal chain length, the chain length of those hydrocarbons. So you can, it's, a, it's synonymous. But this is kind of a nice unit of a parameter to use, reduce temperature. In thermodynamics, we use reduced temperatures, reduced pressures, right, to get corresponding states. It's kind of a similar, similar idea. And uh, what he saw was as you increase the diesel chain length, you increase the, in this case, shear yield, but also the surface viscosity also increased. The PPC, it turned out, was in, was basically it's not implicit. It's very it's, it's it basically moves. It doesn't have a viscosity at least that can be measured under the system. Whereas um, these lipids, you could know. What was really nice about this is that these were the most viscous monolayers that have been measured to that date. Okay, these were the highest surface viscosities that have been measured. Because he has this really unique technique that measures them. Okay? Why hasn't it been repeated for other monolayers? Because that experimental system was so uh, difficult to work with. It was so tedious. Right? That's, how do you convince graduate students to do that work? It takes a lot of work. Um, but the point here is that just by changing the lipid chain length, you can go from something which doesn't have any shear viscosity to something that's quite high shear viscosity. So you can really, this was the first demonstration that you, but by changing the basal chain length, you can really change the properties. Okay? Now, this is such, I think this is a critical paper in the field because it was the first to teach engineering, chemical engineering science, really, um, in the field of microwaves. Before that, the field was completely dominated by electrical engineers, medical practitioners, you know, ultrasonics people, and physicians. And uh, they just saw a bubble as kind of a black box, right? 
And the companies that were developing the bubbles wanted to, they were all in competition with each other, they wanted to keep their formulations proprietary. They did not want to share this information with each other. And so this was the first really to teach the science of how to make it outside of these little research groups that were inside the R&D or different companies. And so I, I feel like this is, if you're going to start in the field of bubbles to read this paper, start with this one. You learn so much from this reading this paper. He didn't just stop with uh, composition, he also looked at microstructure. He, again, he had a fluorescent lipid, and the fluorescent lipid is shown as a bright lipid. And what he found was that he would see these bright interdomain regions and then these dark domains. And the dark domains um, could have different structures, they could be large domains or they could be small domains. And so he found that he could change the microstructure. What he would do is he would heat above the the temperature, the melting temperature of the lipid, and then it would cool down at different rates. These are cooling rates, ranging from a few degrees Celsius per minute all the way to a thousand degrees Celsius per minute. So you had all these different cooling rates he was testing. And he also did some SEM of the lipid shells, and if you draw a line, you can measure the number of defects that you pass as you go through that line. That's the mean linear grain size of microns. That is how long, it, you know, what, what's the distance between a grain to, on average. And you notice that at the higher cooling rate, the grain, the mean linear grain size decreased, which means the defect density increased, right? So by quenching bubbles, that is heating them and then cooling them very rapidly, he was able to get large defect density by heating them and cooling them very slowly, he was able to get low defect density. And he measured that both with electron microscopy and fluorescence microscopy. And basically the data showed that with increasing defect density, your cereal went down much more drastically, but also the surface viscosity went down. It's hard to see the trend in surface viscosity because look at those enormous error bars. That is because, as you'll find, it's hard to get every bubble to have the same microstructure. Right? Every bubble has its own unique processing history, so every bubble has its own unique microstructure. So one of the this is one of the areas that's key for microfluidics is develop ways to get to unify the microstructure, get more uniform microstructure. All right, so that was a sort of seminal paper. Okay. And you might ask, is there a mathematical basis for this link between composition and property of the bubbles? He had shown it experimentally, but do you always have to go back and run an experiment, or are there ways to estimate it based on with computational methods, estimate what those properties are? And my argument is going to be, as chemical engineers, the answer is of course there is. Um, and so like, here's some basic ways to go from composition to property. And I think it can be really stimulated by the folks who are in the molecular dynamics field, right? Is anybody here in the molecular dynamics field? Okay, good. So if I use the wrong term, I'm going to Molecular dynamics people are always coming after me. Um, what, this was a, a study that was published not so long ago by Orsi and Essex, and it's published in PLOS One, so everybody has free access to it. And um, this study, was molecular dynamics of lipid layers, lipid bilayers, okay? And these, they looked at different bilayers, they looked at bilayers that were in the fluid state and bilayers that were in the gel state, okay? That is more solid bilayers. And they, one of the things that caught my eye about this paper was when you look at it, at, the, at this lipid layer, at the right angle, the right orientation, look at how nice the spacing trees are. So he's not forcing them to do this. this the, electrostat the electrostatics and thermodynamics are making this happen. That's beautiful. Right? This is a self-organization. And they're lining up parallel to each other. Okay? Now, everybody in the field that I know, and myself included, had always visualized the bilayer, even in the gel state, as being more like that. And that is what it looks like if you want look at it from the wrong orientation. If you switch your orientation a little bit, because I guess this shows the orientation, 
these kids seem to end up getting into this school. So it's a matter of perspective. But they do line up really nicely. And that was the first inspiration for me is to see that. Right? Because that you can model with, without having to use molecular dynamics, you can use simple models that assume that some of the hexagonal pack where the chains line up. Okay? Second, what was beautiful is we called this uh, the ELBA model, which means the electrostatics based model. Okay? And what that made is this, the same kind of force fields that we're normally used to working with, like Leonard Jones potentials, those were the type of parameters that they used in these molecular dynamics simulations. So, as you'll see, those, those are really nice to work with. Okay? Now, they did core strings around atomic grain. Okay? This is where the molecular dynamics controllers come in. Like, core strain is so, it's not good enough, it should be atomic scale. But I, I like the simplicity of, of course, really, particularly because I'm not doing one other dynamics. I'm just an engineer trying to do these calculations really quickly in like MATLAB or spreadsheet or something like that. But it's kind of interesting to think about some of the things that we're doing here. So for example, one of the things they did was they looked at water and they take this complex molecule that has this bent shape and they give it just a point dipole. It's just a point dipole from a physics that point of view is point dipole. It has an orientation and it has a dipole. Um, they didn't look at fluorocarbons inside, but a lot of other people have looked at fluorocarbons and you can predict the phase behavior of the fluorocarbons with these electrostatic type properties. But here's what they did to the lipid. Now, the lipid, this is a dyed uh, palmitoyl fossa choline, like the, the same kind of lipid I've shown you before. Here's the choline group, here's the phosphate group, here's the glycerol backbone. Here's one um, polymer oil chain, and here's the other. And they coarse grain it. So they took that whole group, whole group, and they just said, boom, that's one part of it that has a positive charge. That's one group that has a positive charge. They took all of these atoms in the phosphate group, boom, that's one group, and that has a negative charge. They took this glycerol backbone, all these carbons and oxygen, boom, that has one group, and it has a dipole moment. Same with these guys, boom, boom, and then the methylene groups. Okay? They took three methylene groups and made it into one group. So the, the number of groups will depend on which one. And then they developed uh, intergroup inter parameters between these groups okay? in the molecular dynamics simulations. So we can go basically use those and just say, okay, so the molecular dynamics simulation says that they're lining up really nicely, so we'll just line them up really nicely. We use the same groups, choline, phosphate, glycerol, ester, and then methylene groups. Now, there's only one head group per lipid, but there's two chains. We can assume they're hexagonal packed, but there's going to be different packing distances between the head groups and the chains, right? Because there's two chains for every lipid, but there's one head group for every lipid. So the head group distance will be different than the tail distance, right? Just between tail groups. So we have these. So we have two different regions, but we can just sum them together when we do the overall calculations. So this is the intermolecular pair potential between two lipids. Okay, not just between two groups, but between two lipids. We have the Coulomb potential. Uh, so the Coulomb potential has a charge in it, and we have the Coulomb potential. We're only going to consider lateral interactions. So choline, choline, phosphate, phosphate, glycerol, glycerol, etc. Because they line up so nicely with those molecular dynamics in there. Even though that was a snapshot in time, there's a lot of fluctuations actually happening on average, they line up. So we're going to sum them together because, well, we have two different groups, chlorine and phosphate, so we have two different groups here. Then we have Leonard Jones potentials. And we have Leonard Jones potentials again between the head groups. So we actually do have Leonard Jones potentials. Why? Because um, there will be a, a long range electrostatic re, um, repulsion, but there's also a short range steric repulsion, right? The poly exclusion principle when two atoms come together, they're like hard spheres like billiard balls, right? So there's a soft potential of electrostatic repulsion and then a hard potential. 
Okay? And there's also an attraction, there's also a dispersion attraction on that too. So we have the attraction and the repulsion. Standard Leonard Jones potential, 612 potential. So we have the head group region, then we have a tail region. We have the ester group here, and then we also have um, the methyl nerves. By the way, the glycerol, I should say, the glycerol is treated exactly the same as the ester group. Um, so we also have, we have a Leonard Jones potential to the choline from the phosphate to the glycerol. That's why we have a third group of hemoglobin. So would you agree that we've taken into account the entire lipid? We have the head, we have the glycerol backbone, and we have the tails. Now, the total potential will be the sum of the head group and the tail group contributions. Now here's the beautiful thing, right? The potential energy is not very helpful by itself in terms of what is the bubble actually going to do when you apply certain forces to it, right? It's a potential energy. So energy isn't as helpful as forces. Energy is beautiful as workers, right? But what we're really interested in is how the bubbles that interact with forces. So you can go from energy to forces just by differentiating energy with respect to the distance. You have to do that for the hydro region and the tail region. So you just simply sum those forces together, and you have the, the force between the molecules. So we have potential between two lipids, and we have the force between two lipids. From the force, you can get the surface pressure because you just you just take force divided by unit length. It's we're gonna we're, we're taking it's it's not per unit of area like we have pressure. Is per unit in line because we're talking about a monolayer, we're talking about a surface layer that has infinitesimal thickness. Okay, so it's, two, so it's force per unit area, newtons per meter. Surface tension is in newtons per meter, okay? Uh, units of newtons per meter. So force per unit length, that gives you surface pressure. And then once you have surface pressure, you can determine the elasticity. The elasticity is defined by how the surface pressure changes as a function of the intermolecular spaces, which you can easily determine because you know the distance. You define the distance between the groups. Again, there's a head group and a tail group component. You just add those up and you get elasticity. So what's, what's great about this is you start with composition. You get from that potential energy. You, you do some calculus, and you end up with elasticity. It does, it's, and it's easy calculus to do. It's just, you're just differentiating uh, power, power. So um, once you do that, you can calculate the elasticity as a function of intermolecular spacing or molecular area. You can do it for each different lipid, and this is what the curves look like. So there's a positive elasticity out to some point, and then it crosses over to a negative elasticity. What does a negative elasticity mean? It's not a real, it's not, it can't be a real thing, right? What, what that means is that at a certain point, the lipids only repel each other. And so they're, they're no longer, they're no longer attracting each other. That's because the electrostatic potential is long range. So once you pull, once the lipids become far enough apart, they just repel each other. They no longer attract each other. Okay? You have to push them together. So initially they don't want to be together, you push them together, and then you make stuff like that. And, you know that you can minimize the potential energy to find the thermodynamic equilibrium. In mechanical engineering, they say you find out where the force is equal to zero, that is where repulsion and attraction are equal. So you can just set this function equal to zero and determine the area per molecule. So it turns out in this case it's about 0.48 meters squared per molecule, which is exactly what people predict for the area per molecule. Minimum area per molecule. It's about 0.45 and we use the model. So you find the, then that's the elasticity that you pick. That would be the elasticity of the microbubble shell. So you can go from composition to comp to property. Mathematically. You don't have to do a bunch of experiments. 
But you have to show it, you have to prove it. So I did do, did do some experiments. Uh, these were experiments that were started by the graduate student Jacob Dove, who now works at Medtronic and was taken over by the Hunt students of that and Joy and Love. Um, and this, this, well, this involves the use of gold coated microbes. So I'm going to show you some of the some of these experimental results. I know we're digging deep, like you probably were thinking of a more of an overview, a bird's eye view, but we're digging in, but it's because I want to give you a sense of what, what you can do with them at the outside, right? You can make gold coated microbiomes. It's not that hard to do. You can do it with the stuff that you can buy. You don't have to make your own outer particles. You just have to make your own bubbles, but even those are not from biotinoid bubbles that are available. Right? So, you can make these things. And the nice thing about a gold nanoparticle is it has these, it's, the gold atoms have these um, valence electrons that are weakly attached, right, to the, to the atom. And so they can kind of move around from one atom to the other and they can, be, they can move around the nanoparticle. And these so-called surface plasmons can move. And what that means is that they have a, a characteristic resonance frequency with electromagnetic waves or with, with light. And so because they interact very strongly with light, they can absorb some of that light energy and dissipate it as heat energy. It's called surface plasma resonance. And these particles are often used in what's called photoacoustic imaging and other types of imaging. Now we put up we put these on the bubble because we wanted these to stimulate the bubble. We wanted to drive the bubble with light instead of sound. So we did these guys with a laser pulse. These guys heat up because of surface plasma resonance. That heat then dissipates into the fluid and ducts into the gas core. So what happens to a gas when you heat it up under constant pressure? It grows, right? So if you give it a quick flash of light, um, then it will grow. And then once the flash of light's gone, the heat will diffuse out and the bubble will snap back and possibly back down. Use different lipids again, following the cues that were from Dennis Kim, C16 to C22. We also have a pegylated lipid, and a pegylated lipid with a biotin, so that we could attach the gold nanoparticle that on it has an atom. Now, we just bought these gold nanoparticles from a company called Nanoparks that sells them already avidinated, so they were already functionalized. It was a really easy experiment to do. We bought the smallest nanoparticle because we wanted just one avidin per nanoparticle. Why is that? Because if this nanoparticle has two avidin and two bubbles come together, then it will actually cause them to bridge and can cause bubble aggregation and even coalescence. So we use really small nanoparticles simply because we wanted only one avidin per particle. But if you do some careful stoichiometry, you can make your own nanoparticles. You can make them larger nanoparticles with one avidin, and you can do the same experiment. Um, now, this experiment I was collaborating with a laser acoustics person. I would never have been able to deal with this on my own because it involved lasers. Um, and, but this is what the forte of Todd Murray lab was to use these lasers. And what he had was the way he designed this experiment is we have a pulse laser that drives the, the, the nanoparticle that then drives the bubble. And then you follow the oscillations of the bubble with a continuous wave laser by measuring the scattering of that laser with the photo detector. So all you're doing is measuring the shadow of the bubble. As the bubble grows, the shadow gets bigger, the amount of light that goes with the photo detector decreases. As the bubble shrinks, the shadow gets smaller, the amount of light that goes in the photo detector increases. It's, it's that simple. And because it's all optics and electronics, you can, ma you can measure really fast. Right? And you can do this experiment like 10,000 times per bubble. And as long as you're not harming the bubble with each experiment, um, you can get all this data, you can average it. And when you do measurements, the noise of measurements, if they're stochastic, if they're random nature, decreases as one over 
the square root of the number of experiments. In other words, the more experiments that you do, the more measurements that you take, you average out that noise. And you increase your signal to noise ratio. Okay. So we, we're, we're measuring nanometer scale oscillations of a microwave. Um, so the mechanism is optical absorption of the pulse laser by the nanoparticles, localized heating, thermal expansion of the gas core, and then rate down of the bubble because this is a pulse laser. So it's like a delta function, you hit it, and then you see how it responds in the next This is what the actual data look like. This is in units of nanometer. These are sub-nanometer oscillations. Okay. I, it took me forever to believe Todd and Jordan and Jake and Ed's doing these plots because I just didn't believe that you could measure displacements of a bubble radius that seemed to be smaller than the actual lipids themselves. Right? Um, but again, it's because of this signal averaging thing you do. You can get this really, really high signal to noise ratio. And so this is the displacement of the ring down of a bubble. It's, uh, it's heated, and so it grows initially, and then the laser pulse is gone, and it just runs back down, and it restabilizes. This, um, this kind of a curve can be fit with a simple model, just a linear oscillator, over damped oscillator. Okay. So for those chemical engineers, remember we talked about damped systems and feedback control. Right? So you have under dam systems, over dam systems. So this is an over dam system. Or it's a dam system, sorry. And so it's ringing back down. And it has a characteristic eigenfrequency or resonant frequency. And it has a characteristic damping ratio. And so for this this bubble in particular was modeled with this black, with the, sorry, the screen of the data is blue, the model is in red. And the fitting parameters are right here. This is the damping ratio, 0.065. This is the eigenfrequency or the resonant frequency, 1.73 megahertz. Now, the resonant frequency. Now, I should point out that that frequency range is right smack dab, right where clinical scanners operate. You're getting resonant at clinical scanners. Excuse me, Professor. What was the morphology of the gold nanoparticle in this unit? These are spheres. Spheres. These spheres. Size? Sorry? Size, size. Uh, these were about five to seven nanometers. So some of the batches, they were five, some of them were about seven. So, so they were really small. They're not the best optical absorbers. You can get much better absorbers. You can just get larger nanoparticles, better spherical, or get these different geometries like nano shells or nano lobs, etc. Much higher absorption cross sections. But um, remember here we were just trying to get uh, a one to one silicon mesh ratio of particle conversion. So that's why we need such small particles. Um, it turns out that the company that makes these is nanoparts is in Loveland, Colorado, which is just up the road. That also helped <laughs> because we could just give them a call and say, hey, we need these nanoparticles. But, yeah, so, um, we did show that you could use these for photoacoustic imaging, but I got much more interested when we, when we were actually getting physical information out of it, because this is information that can help us engineer bubbles outside of the photoacoustic realm. So, this, these are individual plots. These are eigenfrequency. This is like for each bubble, you watch its ring down, you can fit it, you can get an eigenfrequency and a damping ratio. So each one of these dots is a separate bubble, and we have different um, lipids, so GPC, SPC, etc. 616 to 620, all saturated. One of the nice things that you, that you realize is they all fit this power law, a red power law, and that's exactly what theory predicts that they should have. The resonant frequency is changing with the radius precisely as we expect it to. Um, and um, and you can get the elasticity by fitting the resonance curve to the data. So the, fitting, the, the elasticity becomes a fitting parameter 
So and you're normalizing that the size by applying it this way and getting getting a least uh, least squared regression. So for 74 bubbles or 54 bubbles, 37, 27 bubbles, you can get eigenfrequencies, and you get you can plot them. You get beautiful normal distributions. And this is the most beautiful. So I show it first. Um, and it's actually the shortest shape as well. But a beautiful normal distribution with an average and a standard deviation. Average of 2.4 meters per meter is the rest of the Something to think about though, look at that, it's not a single value. Not all the bubbles have the same, exact same elasticity. There's a distribution. It's like this with every kind of molecule, right? Enzymes have distributions um, in their activation of energy. And, uh, and so do these the liquids have uh, distributions in their elasticities. CET, we increase, we go from 2.2 to 3.3. From for C20, we go from 3.3 to 3.9. And then anomalously, everything's happening beautifully, but then with the DBPC, C22, we actually decrease from 2.9. So let me get into that a little bit in a second. This is what the data, these are those data points. Okay, so this is the anomalous C22. But these three data points line up what we expect. So here's the experimental. Here's the theoretical prediction. It actually, we're actually overestimating the elasticity from the theory. Okay, remember the theory is a completely a priori model that's based on molecular dynamics. But we just overly simplified that system. We, just, we lined it, put it up perfectly, <coughs> and we gave them exact difference uh, distances between them. And between them. Um, but, so you can have just a pure lipid, but in fact, you have an emulsifier, so the emulsifier is always C18, so you have to account for that. And it turns out that they don't fit very well. Why? Because the problem with the electrostatic potentials is there's no temperature. Thing. So how do you mix in temperature? Well, the reason that that materials expand is because there's an asymmetry in the in the potential room. Okay. So as the molecules are bouncing back and forth, then that asymmetry leads to a net expansion. And so we model that and we put in that expansion just the same, just saying, okay, we can move the potential energy kT to the right or kT to the left. So let's average and find out. And you get about a one percent uh, expansion in, this, in the area. But that one percent exp expansion, drop that curve down, and it fit beautifully, which is really strange. And you can get uh, such a beautiful correlation between experiment and theory. This is a completely incredible prediction. Okay? I don't. I mean, there's probably, it's probably just lucky. Okay, that, we, that we fit it so well, but the point is that you can go from composition to property. Okay? We do have that capability. Okay? And so we can tune these bubbles. We can actually tune them to ring at the frequency we want them to ring, just like you tune a bell. Okay, there's still this problem, so I'll get to that in a second. It turns out that um, it doesn't do a very good job of predicting the permeability. It does a it made it amazingly smack dab on C18, but for the other lipids, it way over predicts the permeability. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the permeability is much higher than what's predicted. So it's not perfect in terms of all the transport properties. What I did talk about is the damping ratio. So the damping ratio is also determined for each level. And the damping ratio here is plotted for one of the liquids, BPPC, as a function of the radius of that particle. So these are all individual bubbles. And it turns out that the bubble actually has four different damping terms. Okay? It has a viscous damping. Viscous damping is the damping of the water around the bubble. Okay? So if you stimulate a bubble, it's going to ring down. And what are the sources of, it, of the damping? Well, one of them is the viscosity of the surrounding water, right? Water is pretty viscous, especially for a micron-sized particle. feels that viscosity. So that contributes to the damping. 
And these expressions have all been uh, developed and, and validated. So we know the viscous damping work. There's also what's called radiation damping. When the bubble, when the bubble rings, it creates an acoustic wave that then re-radiates out. And this is what becomes really useful for ultrasound imaging, right? But acoustic waves don't just form, they require work greatly. So there's some energy that's lost in the creation of these acoustic waves. That's called radiation damping. Thermal damping. The bubble can oscillate, the gas bar can oscillate in between two states. Isothermal, which is plus the temperature, or adiabatic, plus the neutral, or not neutral as well. So there's these two states, and in either of these two states, there's no heat transfer. But there's no, there's no heat transfer contribution to thermal damping. But in between these two states, there is. Okay, there is heat transfer. When the bubble compresses the heat, some of that heat gets lost to the surroundings. That's a damping mechanism. Okay? As it expands, it pulls, it, it cools, it brings in heat, and there's this net um, heat transfer that leads to thermal damping. So it turns out that we can predict what that is for a bubble. It's probably a, an oversimplification, but at least we can predict it. it as a function of both sides. And if, like, if you take the total damping and you subtract off all of these contributions, you get the, the only thing that's left is just the, the shell. How does the shell affect the damping? We know that the shell definitely slows, definitely damps the bubble oscillations because there have been experiments with uncoated bubbles, and they agree. They really move for a long time with a nice total. But um, these newly coated bubbles and all the other different kind of coated bubbles, micro bubbles, they don't ring as well. They, they stop ringing because of the damping. So there's a high, damp, high proportion of the, damp, of the total damping is from the shell. There doesn't appear to be a good correlation. You can, uh, you can go from shell damping to shell viscosity by applying Newton's law of viscosity to the liquid modeling. And what happens when you do that is you, you start to get a, radius, a radial dependence, right? This is exactly the opposite of what we expect to happen. When you move from a physical phenomenon to a material property, you should be losing the size of the right? The property, the, the physical property, the physical phenomenon should be size dependent, and the material property should be size independent because it's a material property. It just depends on the material that you use, not the size of the material. Right? Viscosity of water shouldn't change if you use a, a tiny pipette of water or a huge tank of water. It's still viscosity of water. Right? That's the same concept here, but here it's changing. So, this is, I think, if anybody wants to take on this problem of the molecular mechanism of dilatational viscosity of a, of a lipid monolayer, I think that would be a beautiful problem to solve. Um, there still is not a molecular level definition of that that explains it. And this, I don't think, does a good job. Okay, so. We went back to saying damping ratio because it didn't seem to have much of a size component when it comes to statistical significance there. The thing to note about the damping ratio, though, is it changes a lot more. There's a lot bigger spread in the data than there was for USDC. This viscosity is, there's a bigger difference between bubble, one bubble's surface viscosity and the other bubble's surface viscosity. Um, here it is for DPC, DSPC, C, so C16, C18, C20, and C22. And uh, you can see that they're pretty broad distributions. But here's the key 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.03. These are actually not statistically different. The only one that's statistically different is this guy. And it's higher than Scott. So the same material that had a lower elasticity has a higher viscosity. And this is actually, you see this often with materials. When you have a material that's, that's becoming more fluid, its elasticity decreases and its viscosity increases. When people are doing elastography with ultrasound of the body, and they see like a tumor, a tumor has a higher elasticity and a lower viscosity, unless it becomes, um, it becomes um, Well, one basically it rots from the core, and then it becomes more fluid inside. So it's as it drops, it's disgusting. 
And it, se it seems to make sense, right? And when the, when the material is all well correlated together, if you have an elasticity, it's more like a rubber band. When it becomes more detoured, decorrelated, um, it becomes more fluid like silicon. Okay, so it seems to, the data seems to be pointing out that this longer chain lipid is somehow becoming more fluid. It's some, it should be more rigid, but there's something going on. All it has to do is Okay, so the time is about 11. So we take a break here? Okay. We'll take a break here and we'll pick back up, uh, finish this up and get into some of this. All right, so I know it's a lot to take in because we're digging like right into experiments here, but I think it'll be valuable. We're going to back out as, as we, we're going to take the distance back today when we talk about some things and I'm going to explain the details a bit more. So we're going to, it's actually going to be an iteration. You're going to see the same kind of content explained in different ways and at different levels of detail, okay? So don't worry if you're not understanding every word I'm saying or even the of what I'm saying in terms of the jargon that I'm using because it'll, it'll start to make sense as we move forward, okay? Um, so I'm going to finish up this lecture and then I'll move into how do we make bubbles. It turns out that this this lecture has actually has 90 slides and only to 34. So I'll try to speed up a little bit just to give you an overview. And then the next the next lecture has a lot fewer slides in it, so be able to move to that faster. Um, <clears throat> so the point of this experiment was to address a problem that was made by issue that was raised by some reviewers and some folks at different conferences on the gold particle bubbles. And that is, what is the effect of the gold particle? Because the, um, the theory that I showed you about the lipids packing together doesn't have any gold nanoparticles in it. Okay? There's no gold there, so what is the effect of the gold? Can the gold interact? Can the gold affect the properties? So, made Jordy go back and redesign the experiment so that we don't need gold nanoparticles. And the way he did this was, he gave you this as a continuous wave laser to track the oscillations of the bubble, and a pulse laser to drive the bubble, but actually in this case, it's, um, it's an infrared laser. So it's a different wavelength, and there's this gimbal mirror which basically puts the focus at angles it away from the focus of the, of the, of the objective, which is on the ball. So in other words, we have this beam that's coming over here of light, of infrared light, away from the ball. And it, it creates a spot. And that's, in the infrared, at 1550 nanometers, that happens to be um, where photons are highly absorbed by water. So we can keep water, and as a function generator, we can change the pulse frequency or the, the wave frequency. So we can create what's called a photoacoustic effect. We keep the water, it creates a sound wave, and we can change the frequency of that sound wave. And then that sound wave comes and it hits the bubble, and it makes the bubble possible. So now, um, there's no, not, it's not necessary to have these gold nanoparticles. And you scan frequencies, and with this lock and amplifier, you can, you can see what the, how the amplitude changes. And so this is what's shown here. So this is a, this is a bubble, a single bubble. It's being driven at three different temperatures. Uh, usually it's at 30, or it's at 25 degrees, and it's here at 31 degrees, and it's here at 36 degrees. And you see a nice characteristic resonant heat. That interestingly becomes larger with increase in temperature, um, and also to increase it becomes sharper. So this is uh, from this you can easily determine the resonance curve, the resonance frequency, which is the heat, and then from the with the uh, full width of half max, you can determine the damping. And so you can get the picture of this Okay. Yeah. 
bubbles are just resting. They're just float up and resting against a glass cover slip. So the glass, the glass cover slip does affect the oscillation. And so I think it's like 20% uh, reduction in the radio frequency. So we can talk about that. Um, that's all the model. Um, and it does affect the absorption of the light. That creates the acoustic waves. So we don't, we're not sure exactly what we do. Uh, we can't sense these waves because it turns out that these waves are only on the order of about Pascal uh, pressure wave. And so uh, actually, they don't make microphones that have that capability. But the bubble is actually a nice one because we can watch lots of oscillation. It has a very characteristic resonant frequency. So the key here, the key result here is number one, that um, it turns out that the elasticity lines up with uh, what we measured with the gold nanoparticles. So the gold wasn't interfering with the elasticity. So it could be reproduced with a completely separate experiment, but also that there's a temperature effect. Um, you know what, I'm gonna save this, these slides, I'm gonna save these for later because I think we should talk more about the shell mechanics before we get into this. So I'm just going to uh, quickly go through this one. And then we'll come back to it. This is the key. This is the lithic shell elasticity that's measured for roughly about 20 bubbles per unit as a function of temperature. And it's kind of interesting that the elasticity increases almost linearly, pretty linearly with the temperature, increase in temperature. And also the shell viscosity is seen to increase with increasing temperature. The take home point here is that if you look at room temperature and body temperature, the elasticity actually significantly decreases, statistically significantly decreases the elasticity. So the bubble becomes softer. This resonant frequency drops when we heat it from room temperature to body temperature. So the moral of the story is be careful about where you do your measurements. When you're doing it. Try, if you're trying to design something that resonates, that resonates in the body, you really match that resonant frequency to room temperature. It makes sense, right? The material properties are a function of temperature, and the elasticity is a property. All right, the bubbles have microstructure. These are perspective um, sensor images. These are, um, of course, the spectroscopy images. In both cases, you see these domains of lipid. They can be large and wrapped around the bubble. They can be individual. They can be packed together. And uh, you see them on the bubbles. Um, the dark, you have these dark domains run by sort of white. Uh, the lipid. Shell can actually melt. We measure this with FCAR. So we're looking at the, uh, the symmetric stretch of the carbon hydrogen bond, but basically we see a shift in the wave number that corresponds to this. The shift corresponds to the melting frequency, melting temperature of the liquid. And in this case, it's, it's ESPC, and it's happening right about 55 to 56 degrees Celsius, where we expect it. So we can melt the, melt the shell and then cool it at different temperatures and get different microstructures. So on this axis, we're changing the lipid. On this axis, we're changing the cooling rate. So as we increase the cooling rate, we go from large domains to small domains. And as we increase the chain rate, we're going from more sort of circular domains to more, more, more ramified domains. And in the extreme, most extreme case, they have the most the uh, longest chain lifted with the highest cooling rate, and we get these snowflakes. These are like two dimensional snowflakes that are sitting on the surface of the bubble, and they have very ramified domains with high defect density. Uh, it's probably this high defect density that it led to the, the lower than expected elasticity and higher than expected viscosity uh, that we observed in this microscope. But the typical message here is that you can use the same kind of material processing that you use with metals, like stainless steel, 
and you can do that in the bubbles. You can manipulate the microstructure of the bubbles and then you can put it in the There's also a phenomenon that you can get phase separation on the surface of the bubble because you have these dark domains and these feature domains in each of uh, it turns out that the pangolated lipid tends to aggregate more in the interdomain region. What that means, what it really means is that the lipid is crystallizing out. Okay, initially it's all mixed, and then the phospholipid is crystallizing out, and the pangolated lipid is being treated as a defect and excluded from these crystalline domains. You see a lot of different mater particle materials phase separate. And every kind of fluorophore that we've used basically separates into the future domain region. It's being confusing because di O and di I. So di O, I think, is sometimes called a lipid that should, should go into, into the gel phase of a bilayer, but it actually goes into the interdomain region of the bubble. Di I, di O, you can just become fluorophores. This is basically trapped in this binding to the bubble surface. And NBD cholesterol, cholesterol, polyions, and having proteins. We always see them face separate. Uh, I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's two different colors here. There's green and red. The red is the di I. Green is the DNA that's being absorbed. DNA is negatively charged. We have a lipid that's positively charged, so it's absorbing. So we're getting faith, we get separation between the charged lipid and the and uh, the di uh, uh, and all these are just different bubbles to show that uh, you can see very well here that um, you know there's no phase separation. That the microstructure not only affects the material properties. You saw in Dennis Kim's paper that it changes the uh, shear elasticity, the shear surface shear viscosity and shear yield. Here we show that it changes the permeability of the films and gases, in this case, oxygen gas. Beta is a measure of the defect density. As you increase the defect density, the permeability increases. That's what you expect, right? The permeability should increase with defect density. Because there's more defects for the gas. Okay, so up to this point, I'm talking a lot about material properties. Hopefully, I've got I've gotten you to believe that you can control the composition and processing, you can control the structure, and the structure affects the material properties. I don't talk much about uh, uh, behavior and applications, but that'll be the, the next part. We'll talk a little bit about, about um, the applications. Now, the microbubbles are mainly used as um, as contrast agents in ultrasound. That's their main current medical use. Okay, that's going to evolve over time. Right now, there's already been two FDA studies on the use of target bubbles for molecular imaging, one that was in the Netherlands for prostate, another one that was done at Stanford in the United States for uh, breast. Those have done uh, human clinical trials have been reported. There's been and a start of two different clinical trials for using microbubbles with focused ultrasound. I'll show you some, some information on that here in a bit. So they're, they're already, they've been around, they've been approved since um, the late 90s for cardiology. They've been more recently approved. I think in India, microbubbles are approved. Contrast and ultrasound is approved for both echocardiography and for radiology. Um, all of these basically involve ultrasound. So let me show you what, what, is, what are some of these ultrasound devices look like. Well, the key to, the, to an ultrasound system, ultrasound uh, imaging system, is the device, is the transducer. The transducer converts electrical, electrical information or energy um, into mechanical energy through these piezoelectric elements. Okay? And there are a bunch of elements that are arrayed like a linear array. And they're all triggered to fire at different times so that you can focus the wave or you can put them all at the same time, you can create a plane wave. And, uh, and then that sends an ultrasound wave into the medium, it interacts with the bubble, the bubble re radiates the sound back, and it can detect that ultrasound. And then the piezoelectric element will then 
transmit that mechanical force into an electrical signal that then is processed by the device to form the image. There's all kinds of probes. Um, there are uh, simple video arrays like this. There's wide angle arrays where the, where the on the curvature, and that gives you a broader field of view. Okay, there's uh, transrectal probes, or remote probes, what we call semi-invasive probes. Um, there are small parts probes that, to get uh, really high resolution, for example, for your audience to understand the carotid artery in the neck. Um, the traditional ultrasound scanner looks like this. Okay? Uh, it's basically a, kind of like a cart that you roll around. Um, a clinical scanner goes on brand new is on the order of one to two hundred thousand dollars. On the market, you can buy used refurbished ones for on the order of ten to two, ten to twenty thousand um, dollars. Compare that to MRI, which is multi million dollars, and you can't just buy those on the market used. You have to have uh, you know, technicians and uh, MRI physicists to set those up. Also, the same with CT. Um, so ultrasound is, is nice because it's inexpensive, number one. Number two is portable. You can see how portable it is. You can literally roll it to the patient's bedside. With all the other imaging modalities, you have to take the patient to the scanner. Um, you can have multiple probes that attach. So these are three different probes that are attached to the single instrument. It's got two more potential attachments here. Um, it's really a simple display, nice big display, simple uh, control system. So these, this is a typical clinical scanner. The ones that image the bubbles the best are these guys. Still these guys. Um, these, these do the best imaging of bubbles. But the technology has shrank a lot. Um, it's become less expensive and more portable. So this is a laptop size agent. This uh, laptop, laptop size um, ultrasound device. These were coming out about 10 years ago. About five years ago, they were coming out with handheld size probes. And just this year, uh, Berkeley IQ, there's another European company that came out with literally these are probes that literally attach to your cell phone. They attach to your cell phone, they have their own power, um, batteries that can be recharged or just replaced. And this thing is going to be selling for $2,000. So they're, they're uh, amazing systems. Um, really powered, well, they're powered here. The ultrasound is powered here, but then all the data analysis, image uh, acquisition, image, image information is done here. Um, they don't have contrast mode on this yet, so we still have to work out with that. But, um, but the point is that as these become smaller and less expensive, ultrasound is just it's gonna take you. I mean it's, you're just gonna see it used more and more because it's inexpensive, it's portable, it doesn't involve ionizing radiation. Um, and the, the contrast agents bubbles, even though they seem scary, they're much less scary than ionizing contrast agents, gadolinium contrast agents, and other chemical contrast agents. The reason that bubbles work so well, so here's the technology, okay? And you can see that this is developing, right? But you'd be unimpressed if I were to tell you that this is where we've gone in 20 years in ultrasound device design. From this to that. But we're using the exact same bubbles that we developed 20 years ago, okay? So we need to, the engineers, in particular the chemical engineers, need to get on this. We need to uh, develop precise, better, more economical bubbles um, that, that, can, that can be used with these types of scanners. Now, the thing is, you can look at that image, and you might be wondering, what the heck is that? Now, if you're an ultrasound technician, you'll know what that is uh, to some degree, but um, there is a problem with ultrasound, and that is just don't get those really nice images. They tend to be pixelated, um, and you get, you get you just don't get, not, it's not just pixelation, but uh, you get these acoustic patterns that make it different, difficult to differentiate different structures in the body. There's MRI, CT, you see these beautiful images that really conspicuously show the neural structure. You can do that 
with bubbles with ultrasound. And that's really the key, is that when you use bubbles, you can start to generate images that are not only are of the same quality as MRI or CT, but they actually exceed quality. You can get higher resolution, um, and you can get faster images. You can choose whether you want higher resolution or faster images. The key is that the interaction of bubbles um, when it interacts with ultrasound are so-called cavitation. Cavitation is a general term that's meant to the, the way that a cavity is a bubble, essentially. A bubble is a cavity of water. Um, and so whenever the thing is moving, it's called cavitation. Okay, so it means different things to different people. But in order to understand you know, how a bubble works, you have to understand the ultrasound. And so ultrasound, basically the way it moves, works is you have this piezoelectric element that's it's this crystal that, that expands and contracts with um, when you apply a voltage potentially across it. So it's moving back and forth like a piston. And as it does that, it's pushing the molecule, the local molecule. And those molecules then translate that energy through molecular collisions. And those that energy then gets translated in what are called longitudinal waves. That is that longitudinal specifically means that the particle motion is parallel to the direction of the acoustic that's contrasted to a shear wave where the, the particle motion would be like this. And most liquids don't support shear waves. So only when you have viscoelastic materials or elastic materials do you get really shear waves. But in all cases, you get large particles. This is the main mechanism that ultrasound works by. The cool thing about it, um, I think for a chemical engineer in particular, is that it's not mass transport, it's momentum transport. Um, you're seeing like a peak, here's a compression, and here's a rear fraction of a wave, but the particles are just moving back and forth. They're just moving back and forth with the passage of the acoustic wave. Okay, so it's not mass transport, it's momentum transport, which means that it follows the wave equation instead of the diffusion equation. Uh, it's important to understand the size of the ultrasound wave compared to the size of the bubble. The bubble is on the order of about 1 to 10 microns in resolution. But an acoustic wave is large. It's on the order of 100 microns to a millimeter, depending on the frequency. The higher the frequency, the smaller the acoustic wave. Okay? But even at 10 megahertz, you're still at 100 microns. That is two orders of magnitude, or sorry, one to two orders of magnitude larger than the bubble. That means that the bubble see, doesn't see the gradient of the pressure Rather, it sees an, an isotropic pressure around it that's changing as a function of time. Okay? So that's really important for the modeling of the bubbles and understanding how the bubbles work. So when the pressure decreases, like this is a rarefaction, or sorry, the pressure is increasing, so this is compression first, the bubble is going to shrink. It's going to shrink equally in all directions. Okay? And during rarefaction, the bubble, the gas will expand, and it will expand equally in all directions. So also, because the bubble is small compared to the wave, it's a scattering phenomenon, not a reflection phenomenon. Sometimes in the literature, you'll see the term bubble reflection or bubble reflectivity or something like that being used. That's the wrong physics. Okay? It's not a reflection, it's a scattering phenomenon. It's like the difference between what air, you know, how air scatters the sun light to give us the blue sky. That's a scattering phenomenon, not a reflection. And then you can see the sun reflected off of the surface of water. That's a reflection phenomenon. Two completely different phenomena. They both involve light, but they're different phenomena. So that's important to understand what bubble is. It's a scattering phenomenon. So when you're talking about the echo of a bubble, it's a backscatter. Well, it's scattered, but it's scattering bad. There's all kinds of different um, phenomena that happen. Get the acoustic, uh, acoustic backscatter. You can, if you have a bubble that's oscillating near a surface, the surface imposes an asymmetry that changes the way the bubble oscillates. If a bubble oscillates for a, a continuous period of time, so it's long, long pulse current, it can actually create a little streaming, micro streaming, that can then be used 
to uh, facilitate mixing in the liquids. You can do bubble fragmentation. You can drive a bubble. If you drive it hard enough, it will actually fragment into smaller bubbles. You can cause it to dissolve. Instead of fragmenting, it gets a little bit smaller on each cycle. It's called acoustic dissolution. There's a thing called inertial cavitation, where because of a strong because of the strong collapse of the bubble, it creates a strong acoustic wave that's very strong, very broad band. It's like, it's like a shock wave. And there's also a cool thing called acoustic radiation force. You can push bubbles in the direction of the acoustic wave. That's what's called acoustic radiation force. There's two kinds of acoustic radiation force. There's primary radiation force, where you push the bubbles in the direction of the acoustic wave. And then there's this cool phenomenon where if two bubbles oscillate in phase, they attract each other. If they oscillate out of phase, they repel each other. And it's a completely hydrodynamic phenomenon, but it, you can see it in the lab, and it's really cool phenomenon. And we can use it, and I'll show you some examples of that. So there's a lot of phenomena that we can take advantage of here in different applications. Okay. Imaging, you might be interested in this, and this, a drug delivery, you might be interested this, 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 as well as that. So there's a lot of phenomena. And there's more and more phenomena being observed every year uh, with these bubbles. OK, so there's two different kind of regimes of, of oscillation. There's small amplitude oscillations, and there's large amplitude oscillations. So let's start with small amplitude oscillations. For when we're trying to determine the echo of a bubble, <coughs> um, we can do we can start with just assuming that it's a Rayleigh type scatter, and we can use the following equation to describe the scattering cross section. Now, scattering cross section is sigma sub s, and it's equal to the scatter power. So, power being units of energy versus energy over time divided by the incoming intensity. Intensity is energy per unit area per unit time. So energy per unit time over energy per unit area per unit time means you get an area. Okay? So that's why they call it cross-section. It's like a cross-sectional area. But what it's telling you is like how strong the reflection is. That's what it's really telling you. It has units of area, but it's telling you how strong the reflection is. Why intensity? It turns out that ultrasound, you can either you can either think of it as pressure or you can think of it as in terms of energy as intensity. Um, it's harder to think of it in terms of energy. Right? It's easier to think of it in terms of intensity. Okay, and so you have this long equation. It's actually not that bad. You've got this three term and there's the one term in the brackets and so on. So three terms. The first term contains this is the wave number that contains the frequency of the ultrasound wave in this term. Right? So the wave number of the small is higher frequency. Uh, these, these are, the A is a particle radius. So notice that there's A bracket to the fourth power, there's another A to the second power. That's A to the sixth power. The scattering cross section goes as the radius to the sixth power. That's why many times we use micro bubbles instead of nano bubbles because just that one order of magnitude difference in size leads to a six order of magnitude difference in the backscatter effect. Then there's these other terms the bulk modulus and the particle modulus. The bulk modulus is the modulus of water, and then you have the particle modulus, which is given by the material that's used to, or to uh, fill the bubble. And it's, it's a thermodynamic property is equal to um, the volume over the change in pressure and change in volume. Okay, so it's a thermodynamic property. It's a measure of the compressibility. Right? How much the, the compressibility is how much if you give it a certain pressure increase, how much it decreases in volume. Okay. Measure of the compressibility. Then we also have terms for the density, the right? density of the medium and the density of the why am I showing you this equation? Well, I'm just showing you this is a, a really scattered equation, but 
that turns into this plot here. This plot here is so revealing. This plot is what should convince you that you've got to use bubbles and not, uh, and not liquid particles or solid particles as much as that much as it is. And this was uh, a plot from Lars Hoff in his book. Um, I highly recommend you to read that. It's a great introduction to the physics of bubble oscillations. Um, on this x-axis is plotted the relative bulk modulus, so this is the bulk modulus of the particle compared to that of the medium, and the relative density, so the density of the particle compared to that of the medium. And this has this kind of characteristic curve to it. Okay? And there's different materials, so there's air, rubber, glass, and even steel tungsten. On the y-axis is the contribution scattering to the cross-section, so you can think of this as, as how that affects the scattering cross section. So let's start with let's just start with steel. Okay? Steel is five, so the plot, so the the contribution of, let's see, of density is right here to five. So it's right here. It has its contribution ten to the negative two to ten to the negative one right here. And then the contribution from the bulk modulus is here, so it's five. So 10 to the negative 1 to the negative 3, okay? So those contribute to the scattering cross-section of that steel particle. An air bubble, because it's such a, so much different compressibility, the contribution to the scattering cross-section is way up here, just here. So please check that out. These guys are all about, let's this, this round up and say 0.1. Contribution. The bubble's up here. Let's round down to 10 of a second. That's eight orders of magnitude difference in scattered cross section. Eight orders of magnitude difference. It's almost a trillion times per. That's why we use gas. This is so much more epigenic, right? It's off, almost off skin. If you, this were a linear plot, this thing would be way off skin. So, that gas core, that highly compressible core, is what leads to bubble being epigenic. The density doesn't it doesn't have much of an impact, and you'll hear this miscorrected um, language used when describing bubbles. They'll say you'll see this in the literature. They have a different um, acoustic impedance than water. Well, acoustic impedance is the speed of sound is a product of the speed of sound or density, um, and the point that they're trying to make is that, that it's, a, it's a reflection phenomenon. It's not, it's a scattering phenomenon, and it's not the, not the acoustic impedance, it's the compressibility that leads to that high scattering cross So bubbles are inherently epigenic. The rate of scattering fails to even capture all the bubble physics. They actually are even better acoustic backscatterers than that because. They can have large scale oscillations, they can have resonant phenomena, and that sound re radiation. So, it does, the Riemann scatter does give you a first impression of why bubbles are such extreme scatters compared to liquid, but it gets even better than that. You consider the bubble, you can consider the bubble as, a, as an oscillator. Okay, so, it has a mass and spring and a dash pod, a damping. And the bubble, gas core is the spring, okay? So if you stretch the bubble, the gas becomes too thin, it wants to snap back to its original size. If you compress it, right, it wants to snap back to its original size, right? Just the equation of state. Ideal gas is a spring. The liquid is the mass. The liquid around the bubble has to be pushed out of the way, and then when it's coming in, that liquid is coming in, you have to force all that liquid to come back in, Center of the bubble during compression. So if you push it out during refraction, you pull it in during compression. So the liquid is the mass. And then there's all kinds of different, uh, I told you there's multiple mechanisms by which um, that energy is gained. There's also an electrical analogy, but um, I didn't take enough work to write down, so I'm not going to I think the mechanical oscillator is, is perfect, it does a beautiful job. But there's also the analogy to the electrical system if you're more interested in that. Again, 
again, this is all on top. So I'm going to do that. This is a, a simulation of level oscillation. So one micron per meter, well, three megahertz, 100 kilopascal per kilo pressure. And this is slowed down, obviously. It's much happens to see well over five microseconds. But what do you notice about the bubble? What's it doing? It's changing the volumes. Volumetric oscillations is increasing the size and decreasing the size as that acoustic wave passes over. And it's a lot of oscillation. There's actually some radiation force displacement here too, but it's mainly what I want you to see is that volumetric oscillation. These are well within the parameter space of contrast models. So this is a so realistic view, even though it's a simulation of what happens to a bubble. If that bubble is oscillating, it's going to be pushing water, pulling water, pulling and pushing, pulling and pushing. And that is creating these acoustic waves that then re radiate back. So your spherical waves are re radiating in all directions, but your transducer is here, so it's capturing those re radiated waves. When you model it like that, so just acoustic scatter, even if for very small amplitude oscillations like Lunar G, here's what you what it is, what kind of difference you see in the resonance. You get a three order magnitude increase. Beyond the eight orders of magnitude that we already got because of the gas core, you get a good three orders of magnitude because of resonance. Um, here it shows this is frequency versus standard cross section. And you can see the effect of frequency for different level sizes here, one micron, 10 microns, 100 microns. Notice that the resonant frequency, which is the peak, as you increase level size, is shifting to lower frequencies. Okay? Larger bubbles resonate at lower frequencies, small bubbles resonate at higher frequencies. Um, also shown here, this is if you're sonicating, this is 1 megahertz, 0.1 megahertz. And these are the resonant bubbles. The bubbles here will be between 1 and 10 microns. Even diameter will resonate at megahertz frequency. So that is really key. That's your the ultrasound scanners are already operating in megahertz frequency. And so we have resonators that resonate at those frequencies that happen to be micron size. So you can see that's, well, here maybe it's an order of magnitude or so. It depends on uh, the bubble diameter. But you can also, you can kind of see here the importance of having a narrow size distribution. If you have a broad size distribution between 1 and 10 microns, these particles that are here aren't even registering. They're off scale. You certainly get a strong interaction here, and these guys aren't resonating as strong. And it's a non-linear phenomenon. Right? This goes up and it comes down and it comes back up again. So it becomes really hard to quantify if you have a range of bubbles. Let's you know, get a certain amount of scattering, how many bubbles that actually is. Because we don't know if it's a bubble. You get the same cross section of a bubble of that size, and a bubble of that size, and a bubble of that size. That that can make it challenging, so we need to be able to have narrow size distributions. This is kind of what I was talking about. We've done all this engineering for ultrasound devices, but not enough for, for microwave themselves. Large amplitude oscillations of delivery of the equation. That was not planned to provide this. You can go through a derivation if you guys really want it. Um, let us know, but this is basically the Navier Stokes equation boiled down to a bubble. And these terms are called for the shell, the bubble shell. So there's a surface viscosity, or there's a viscosity of the medium, and there's a viscosity of the surface of the shell. And then there's a surface tension. So this is actually a root of set simulation of the bubble. Um, it seems like a tough equation. It's got, go back. you know, it's got, um, Double derivative here. It's a nonlinear equation, as you can see. There's a square here, there's a double dot. But uh, most of the term, it's actually a, it's a it's a ordinary differential equation. It's not linear, but it's ordered ordinary. It's not a partial differential. So you can solve it in that way. And, uh, 
when you have the shell, there's a nice model by Monotron. I'll talk a bit about more about this in a bit. But basically, the lipid shell has three regimes. An elastic regime, which is actually over a very small area. And then it's got a ruptured regime and a buckle regime. I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. But this has done a better job of, of analyzing the level oscillation. Um, in these different genes, surface tension changes differently in function of the total radius, bubble area, and the total radius. Okay, so this is it's zero, surface tension is zero in the buckling region. Okay, it changes here with area to the elastic region. And then it becomes just the surface tension of water, so a constant value in the ruptured region. There's still some skepticism about whether um, this curve should stop, should, it should stop here and go over, or if it should go up and then move. Okay. So there's some controversy. I think that it should go up, which is sufficient options here. But it's just about modeling and adding extra parameters. So here's a more simplified schematic. You initially have a bubble, it's got a uniform, continuous model layer. When you expand it, that monolayer cracks and fragments. And then when it hits in its initial size, it's reformed, resealed. Okay? But then during compression, it's inextensible. It can't be compressed very well because it's a monolayer, so it just bends and folds. It's like a sheet of paper. Okay? You, you take a sheet of paper, um, you, you, you can't compress it because it's flat. It just bends and folds. That's what the monolayer is. So here we have zero tension. Here we have the tension of the pre-gas water interface. And then in between these regimes, we have an elastic regime over a very, very small region area. Um, but this model is able to capture these asymmetric <coughs> oscillations of microbubbles that are observed with high speed cameras at the, at, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, these asymmetric oscillations. <coughs> Those were compressing more than they were expanding. And it's a it's a pressure phenomenon. So at lower pressures, you see more asymmetry. At higher pressures, it starts to oscillate uh, more symmetry. So that's a little bit about the bubble physics. Um, here's two terms in the bubble world you often come across: stable cavitation versus inertial cavitation. Stable cavitation refers to that you can you can drive the bubble to oscillate, but when you're done, the bubble is stable. So the bubble starts at a certain size, ends at a certain size, as the same size. That's stable oscillation. Inertial cavitation means that you drive the bubble so strongly that it actually breaks apart because it dissolves away. So these are the terms that are often used. Stable cavitation is often, is often detected by harmonics in ultrasound, whereas inertial cavitation by a broad decay of response because this strong collapse of the bubble that happens here um, is causing uh, a shock wave. By the way, these are what we call acoustic street images. It's a line from the center of the bubble that's smeared out over time. <coughs> so it's like taking the diameter of the bubble and smearing that diameter. So we're watching the bubble, this is the bubble loss. <coughs> so why am I been talking so much about liquid shell bubbles? Well, uh, it turns out that there's other materials that are used, polymers and proteins, as well as surfactants. Well, surfactants, the issue is biocompatibility. With polymers, it's, it's this problem. So you can make really stable polymer bubbles. Very, very stable. You can actually dry them out and rehydrate them. You can do that with liquid bubbles too. But, but polymer bubbles can be very stable. And the polymer shell can be loaded with drugs. A lot more than you can get to look at. The problem with these guys is that they form such a stiff shell that often they don't even oscillate. <coughs> so you can drive them and nothing happens. 
thoughts. And so we don't get a very strong reflection. But also, what happens in, in some of the times, this is the initial bubble, is that when it's being driven, it forms a crack in the, in the shell. And the bubble wants to expand. And the only way for the place it can expand is through that crack. So the bubble actually extrudes itself out of the shell during refraction. And then during compression, the center of mass of the bubble is in a completely different place than the center of mass of the shell. So you get this cracking, the bubble extrudes out, and now you have a free bubble in the shell. So, and this happens at high pressures. Okay? So you're using higher ultrasound intensities, sometimes you're getting nothing, and other times you're getting, this is a, another set of images that show, here's the shell, there's a bubble, the bubble extrudes out, now the bubble's down here and the shell's here. Okay. Does everybody understand this phenomenon and what's happening? The shell breaks, the bubble is extruding out of that break. It's the only place that it can't expand. And it wants to expand with this refraction. <coughs> Uh, this also happens for protein shells, such as algorithm shells. This was a uh, work that was done by Michelle Castella. This is a protein shell region called the Quantason. And here you, you see the gas core of the shell, and then the shell is extruding out of the bubble. So here's the shell left behind, and here's the gas core. So, um, when this happens for protein bubbles, it depends on the amount of cross-linking and how stiff you make that, that shell. So you can have some protein bubbles can be very flexible like ribbons, others can be more stiff like polymers. Okay. So proteins give you that option to move with that somewhere between ribbons and, and polymers. Polymers, we've done a lot of work on polymer shells, it's just that this phenomenon is not ideal. Right? If, you want to, if you want to image the same particle moving, Right, you can't do it with this part. You need to do that if you're doing like high resolution imaging. Okay. So they can take advantage of the, all these nonlinear oscillations, cyclotharmonics, high harmonics, nonlinear frequency mixing, pulse inversion, where you take the same pulse, but you convert its polarity. So instead of doing compression first, you do refraction first. Sub or ultra harmonics, acoustic destruction, loss of signal, or a combination of some of these. For example, uh, CPS, pH uh, pulse sequencing, sometimes it's contrast pulse sequencing. You do both phase and amplitude <coughs> modulation. So, here's an example of CPS emission. On the right hand side is a typical B mode scan. It's a B mode scan of the human liver, it's taken in Germany. And the bubbles are, are coming in. So you're, what you're watching is uh, the inflow of bubbles into the uh, sorry, the sort of previous liver. Uh, and there happens to be a focal nodule here, which is like a kind of like a benign tumor. And <clears throat> in the demo image, you see the large vessels, you can start to see an increase in the scattering because of the bubbles coming through. Now, Blood scatters ultrasound less efficiently than tissue, so blood often appears dark or hypoechoic in ultrasound. So the bubbles actually make that lighter and make it easier to detect the um, blood flow. But what's going on over here? It's hard to tell. Over here is the CPS image. This is taking advantage of the nonlinear echo and echo bubbles. The CPS you can actually image a single bubble at tissue depth within the box. So imagine that a one or ten micron diameter bubble within a box that's a millimeter by a millimeter in size. So you're imaging extremely high sensitivity. And now you're now you can see all these different structures in the blood vessels, right? So you can see this these branches that are happening, so some individual bubbles moving through capillaries. Um, one of the things that's really useful here is you can see that the tumor is actually filling faster than the surrounding tissue, which tells you that this is a has a more um, phase arterial phase in, in the surrounding tissue, which gives the sonographer a clue that this is actually a, a 
the non-rather malignant mass. Without that, you just see a mass, and so you'd have to go back and you'd have to do some kind of testing to find out about that mass, right? You, you find the mass with ultrasound, and you're, you tell your the patient, okay, come back in two or three weeks when we can schedule your MRI, which is going to be very expensive, so we can figure out what that mass is. And imagine a poor patient has to suffer through two or three weeks before they can get that MRI and find out whether that mass is benign or malignant, where they can get instantaneous information on that with the use of contrast. And in fact, this is being used and it's really being pushed in Canada in particular for diagnosing um, open nodules. But it's also being widely used in Europe. And uh, just recently in the United States, it's been approved for radiologists. So you see more and more clinical trials that are being but the point is, look at the difference. This is an old image. This was, I think this is 15 years old now, this image. Yeah, this, this picture. So the technology has advanced even much, much more beyond us as a part of the picture. But look at the quality of the image. Is this, is this. That's the difference. That's what falls to you. That's why you want to spend some time energy into engineering bubbles. So you and these are not these are poorly engineered bubbles. Right? But they enhance and provide information that is that's impossible for the otherwise of course. So this is the key. Um, there's been recent papers coming particularly out of the group in France uh, at the Institute of Green there where they have seen amazing structures. Like structures of the vast of the, of the brain vast structure, uh, with resolution that goes down to about 10 microns. So extraordinary energies that are being created, but you have to use bubbles. You need that really high scattering uh, particle. And it turns out bubbles are, we talked about it in biocompatibility, but bubbles are very biocompatible because it's just gas, water, and liquid or vacuum. Okay, let's really talk about applications. Like we're in the gene talk I'm going to talk a lot more about things that are in the so I'll just quickly go through. Let's have molecular imaging. The idea here is instead of just imaging blood flow, you have bubbles that are binding to the vasculature through specific ligand receptor interactions, biochemistry. So that we can image not only the architecture, the anatomy of the vessels, and the blood flow, the functional information, but phenotypic information of the disease state for the vasculature. That's non invasive bias. That's really important. It's just sort of the image of both flowing into a tumor. It's just a high frequency, high resolution, ultrasound imagery of a tiny little tumor in the mouse side. Now, this is the type of images that we can create already with uh, uh, molecular imaging. So you, this is a tumor and we're looking at the angiogenesis of the tumor. There's also cardiac drug delivery. The idea here is that you hit the bubbles with a higher intensity ultrasound. And that ultrasound and the interaction with the bubble, remember ultrasound is operating on a millimeter scale. Okay, so when you focus ultrasound, you, the highest you can get is about the size of a grain of rice. But the bubble focuses that energy into the micron scale, so the same size, same size scale as cells. So it can disrupt, disrupt without destroying, it can disrupt the vasculature to allow drugs to penetrate through the endothelium into the tissue. You can in situ change the pharmacokinetics of a drug using ultrasound. So the pharmacologists haven't caught on in this yet great detail, just a few of them have, but when, when, they, when they realize the potential that you can non-invasively change the pharmacokinetics of a drug, that suddenly, that changes, that changes almost everything in pharmacology, right? You don't, it's not just take a pill and wait to see what happens, right? You can actually control what happens. And I think that's the beauty of engineering, is control, right? The ability to sense, and manipulate. Um, MRI guided high P, these 
systems are already available commercially. So you can you can track a temperature field within the brain, for example, and then you can manipulate the temperature field before it's focused out. This is what the patient looks like. It's got this big box because you have to have an acoustic coupling between the transducer of piezo elements and the head. Um, otherwise, you just get a strong reflection. It doesn't pass through the air very well. So, there, so that's why uh, it has this kind of funny looking thing. It's just because it's full of water. So it's not that, it's not that uncomfortable. It's just, it just looks big and bumpy. But it goes into the MRI uh, core and you can image the brain. It's, it's being done in the brain and also it's been approved in the US and in Europe also for treating uterine fibroids. So uh, it's, the idea is that you have like this parabolic array of all these transducers and they're firing at different times so that the ultrasound waves arrive at a certain location all at the same time. And you can do a CT of the skull to find out what the attenuation characteristics of the skull are and the speed of sound and all that stuff, so that you can properly time all those to get through the skull and get a very tight focal registration in the brain. And you can image that with ultrasound, or with MRI, image the temperature field with MRI. So it's completely non-invasive. And you can use that to open a blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is you have the vessel, and then what lines the vessel are these endothelial cells very vascular space, some mastocytes, and then out here are the neurons. And the problem with many drugs is they can't get to the neurons. There have been neurotrophic factors that are known to improve neurons in terms of that have been damaged by Parkinson's, by Alzheimer's, by other diseases, traumatic brain diseases, inflammation, and so forth. But those drugs can't get through that blood brain barrier. There's tight junctions at the molecular level that are preventing them to get them to include. But with ultrasound and bubbles, you can di transiently disrupt that blood brain barrier and allow drugs to get through. So, this has already been shown in animals, and it started just a couple of years ago, the first human trial. So, this is the first patient um, that was treated for brain cancer. She was doing microbubbles and ultrasound, and also a chemotherapeutic agent. And the idea was that the bubbles would help the chemotherapeutic get into the into the tumor. Now this study was just a safety study, but there may also be some therapeutic benefit. First patient was in 2015. It's being done at uh, Toronto Sunnybrook Hospital. The main physicist, Calergo um, Enemy, is the one driving that research. They also treated the first Alzheimer's patient with microbubbles and ultrasound. It's known to stimulate uh, the immune system to also come in and break down those Plaques, so no drug is even needed here, it's just ultrasound and bubble. So the first ultrasound patient was just with the old, uh, just a little bit less than a year ago, which was in March of, uh, March or April of uh, 2017. So this is all happening, it's all, it's all coming to uh, fruition. And uh, image guided drug delivery. So you can image and deliver at the same time using the same bubbles and the same ultrasound device. Right here, uh, there's a tumor right here in the kidney. And this is a, a rat tumor. And there are bubbles here, and there's focus ultrasound being applied right here. So, let's see, initially at the beginning of the scan here, okay, there's bubbles, and then all those bubbles are being cleared which is a way to assess the dose of the drug that's being delivered, and also to make sure that you're on target to deliver that drug. So, um, I wanted to, I'll have this acknowledgement slide in the end of this slide, but the work is funded by Ronnie Institute, so of course, so that group does all that work of what you're seeing uh, here. So, so with that, I'm gonna, Stop that. See if there's any questions. It's 12 o'clock. Do we have some more time? Uh, what time is this session supposed to end? I think it's supposed to end. No, no. Start the clock in order. Just start the clock in order. Let's let me just get into a little bit in because your your lab practical is going to be about sonication with synthesized bubbles. 
Um, so, you know what we could do? Um, is we could, I could give that lecture twice. And so a couple of you could be working on the practical, while half of you are giving the lecture, and then we'll check and we'll switch. Is that sound? Is Samir right? Is Samir nearby? Because in, in, in this case, it may be better to stop for lunch and then and then uh, you can you can you can rotate. So you might just sit in the room and come back. So can you email the link to the right and then all groups? So while while Samir's on his way, let's. Let me see a few questions. I went through the material pretty quick at the end there, so I'm sure there are, are a lot of questions, but um, take take comfort in knowing that everything that we've covered, we're going to recover it slower and in more detail throughout the week. Okay, so what I gave you was, like if I had to tell you everything there is about bubbles in three hours or whatever, that's what I would do. That's, that's but there's a, there's a lot of detail that's missing. But hopefully you're excited about it. It turns out they're super easy to make. I mean, they're not the easiest thing to make, but they're easier to make than a lot of people. And uh, they're pretty stable, and they work. That's the greatest thing. And you expect them to work. If you do an injection, of an animal, you inject the bubbles in this way, you watch them with a culture sound, you'll just see it light up every time. But the question is, what are you trying to do? How precise of a treatment are you trying to give? And that's when you start to see, that's when it starts to become very useful to engineer the bubbles. And also, the imaging that I showed is not quantitative. It's qualitative. You see, you can see these vascular structures, but if a pixel is is brighter, that means a, like a higher white color. Um, you don't know how. It, does that mean that there's ten times more bubbles? It's ten times brighter, or does, what does that mean exactly? Right? Um, we don't know. We don't have an ability to quantify. We don't have an ability to say that the, the that pixel intensity corresponds to that many bubbles. The reason that's useful is because in order to get this uh, protocols approved, the FDA, you need some quantitative value to it. So you can compare data that's taken at one institution or one hospital to data that's taken at another hospital or another hospital that use different ultrasound machines, maybe even different bubble manufacturers, but the, the data is, is relevant to the biology and it's reproducible and it's quantitative. So that's a really important piece of the, of the puzzle, is the getting it to be quantitative. In my mind, that's that's what's really in the field of making the ultrasound vision above this ultrasound.